Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 673 of the podcast and it is Thursday the 2nd of February 2023 as I record this a little early as I'm off to the USA. More on that coming up. In today's show, I'm talking to Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, who is Choctaw, and we talk about terminology like American Indian, writing diversity, how to research different points of view and cultures, and why we need to talk about these things rather than shy away from them if they feel too difficult. So that's coming up in the interview section. So there's nothing too exciting in publishing and book marketing. So straight into my personal update. As I record this, the Kickstarter has a couple of days left and it's almost at £20,000, which is around US dollars which is kind of incredible considering I put my goal as £1,000. <laughs> but by the time this goes out, it will have finished. So it is too late if you missed out. Uh, I'll have to tell you what it hit next week, or you could pop over to Kickstarter If you search pilgrimage, it will come up. And in the next few days, I will set up the pre-orders on some of the various editions. Uh, The various formats will be available, just not signed on my store, creativepenbooks.com in April and the usual stores in May. So I'm doing like a three-stage release Kickstarter. Everyone's going to get it on Kickstarter. And if you back the campaign, thank you so much. You're amazing. I'm beyond pleased with how it's gone. And obviously, I'm going to do a lessons learned because that's how I roll. I will do that on this show once I've done the fulfillment. Uh, And if you did back it, you will be getting um, the ebook and the audio book pretty quickly. And then uh, what once the payments have gone through on Kickstarter, and then I will be doing the signed, I'm actually going to the printers plant, I'm going to be signing all the books and getting them shipped. So uh, it won't be released elsewhere until everyone has their copies. Um, But then again, I will do sell it on creativepenbooks.com first and then everywhere else in May. So essentially, it's a sort of let's take all the chunk of the direct money (laughs) personally first and then put it on all the stores. And that's that kind of reversal of the creator economy, sort of flipping it on its head. Instead of directing all the traffic to the stores, you direct all the traffic and the sales as much as possible to your own uh, controlled stores and or Kickstarter and then put it elsewhere later. So anyway, yes, I am beyond pleased with how it's gone just kind of amazed I I, I didn't because of course this book falls between all the gaps <laughs> it's not a it's not fiction by JF Penn and it's not non-fiction for authors by Joanna Penn it's kind of a new thing So yeah, I'm very pleased. Thank you so much. So as this goes out, I will be in Washington, D.C., a city I've wanted to visit for a while. I've never been before. Uh, I'm on the hunt for story inspiration. So it is a kind of book research trip for my next arcane thriller. I'll be visiting the Museum of the Bible, uh, which I've I've heard good things about, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, one of the Smithsonians. And of course, I will be wandering around taking pictures of stunning architecture. Hopefully it won't be too cold. You can find pictures on my Instagram or my Facebook at JF Penn Author. Then I'm heading to Colorado Springs for the Superstars of Writing conference. And I'm trying to uh, push my imposter syndrome aside because I'm one of the teachers. And um, I'm looking forward to catching up with author friends who I haven't seen for a while. So that is where I'm going to be. I have also finished, I can't believe I did this as well, but um, I wanted to push, 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 push. I have finished and launched my new short story, With a Demon's Eye, which you can buy at creativepenbooks.com in ebook and audiobook. I narrated the short story myself. In fact, I did that yesterday. (laughs) It's amazing how fast you can get out an audiobook when you can do it all yourself, master it yourself, and then uh, put it on your own store. So I was pretty thrilled that I started recording, I don't know, around 7 a.m., Um, obviously finished it, edited it, uh, mastered it, 
published it, sent out an email and sold it all in one day. And, and uh, the money, I guess, will come in tomorrow. Um, so pretty excited about that. If you are interested, I've also got a blog post that's coming this week as this show goes out with all the ways I used AI tools in the process of writing, editing, cover design, publishing. And that blog post will be out this week on the blog. The With a Demon's Eye is... Uh, on pre-order at all the usual stores but as I said you can get it right now at creativepenbooks.com so might you be interested well I shall read you the blurb with a demon's eye a short story with a supernatural edge by J.F. Penn how far would you go to see again conflict photographer Sarah Miles loves being embedded with the military out in the desert Her pictures pay tribute to those who fight, suffer and die for freedom, and the images she captures can turn public perception in the never-ending war. Her photography matters. But when Sarah is caught in an explosion out on patrol, her eyes are damaged by a face full of shrapnel. She may never be able to see through a lens again. The military offers her a cutting-edge operation to restore her sight. But it comes with a price. So there you go. And this is my weird little story that I've been calling the eyes story uh, for years now. This is one of these, um, when I had my laser surgery about four years now, it was certainly pre-pandemic, it must have been four, even five years ago, I had laser eye surgery. And the experience of that, how weird that is, if you've had it, you know what I mean, made me think I really have to write about this. And also I read a, um, I've got, it's all in the author's note, but essentially I read a conflict photographer um, memoir and I was like, this is crazy crazy. Why would people do this? And both of those things kind of came together. And I've used lots of AI in an ethical manner in this story. So um, and this, as I mentioned, the blog post will explain all. So that's that's also happening. And out now also is the advanced self-publishing podcast with me and Orna Ross, where we discuss opportunities for indie authors in 2023, including the creator economy, the rise of AI tools and what the changes to social media might mean for authors this year. So you can find that episode on the Ask Ally podcast. So that's Ask A-L-L-I podcast on your podcast app, wherever you're listening to this. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Sarah Rosette said about Steve's episode on Selling Direct, really enjoying this episode. It's great to hear about more authors doing direct sales. An interesting detail about adding our author photo to receipts. I hadn't thought of that. It's a great way to emphasize that we're human. And indeed, if you order a print book from my store, (laughs) creativefunbooks.com, you should get a receipt that has me on saying thank you. So uh, hopefully that works. Dan Kenner sent a picture, um, said listening to the show while taking care of the goats in minus 20 degree weather. Glad to have something positive to take my mind off the cold. And a lovely picture of Dan wrapped up (laughs) in all his warm gear with his goats in the snow. That is so cool. Also, lovely email from Tara. He said, thank you for introducing me to ChatGPT. If it wasn't for you, I might not have given this a try. You've given me back a lot of hope that has dwindled over the last couple of years. I'm a writer with a rare neurological disorder that affects my health. I have a lot of limits now. This tool is an amazing assistance for someone like me with a chronic disorder or illness that puts limits on how we can healthily spend our energy and time. It can do so many things that would have taken me hours or days I was able to plan all my book promotion, blog posts, emails, social media posts, keywords, hashtags, pitches, outlining. Brain fog makes it so hard to stay focused so a thousand word article could take me all day to write. The outline keeps me on track and finished in a couple of hours. I might even be able to freelance again, something I didn't think I'd be able to get back. I can see it's truly possible to market with aids like this and still be able to do the writing. In time savings alone, it's amazing. I have so much hope again. And I wanted to share that email and I did get permission from Tara to share it uh, because so many people are thinking of the negative ways of AI, but these truly, truly positive ways are so important. And 
I mean, personally, I, uh, I'm i now not suffering from uh, COVID or post-COVID syndrome or whatever. But during that time, a, a tool, these tools would have just really helped. And even even if you're not, if you don't have deficits, they're amazing tools. I mean, I use so many AI tools in my um job now like for example this podcast i use descript descript is an ai um editing tool um it does it's just fantastic <laughs> So, I mean, I use tons of different tools. In fact, I have started a blog post about the tools that I use and what I use them for, um, because, of course, I change them over time. And I kind of wish I'd done one a decade ago so I could compare it. But I'm always picking up new tools. And this is the thing. It's all about having a a think of it like leverage. So I'm a one person business and I can achieve more if I have more uh, leverage. So all these tools just just help us. So please, if you haven't tried ChatGPT, give it a go. And as I mentioned, I have a blog post next week or this week as this goes out, which will go into, uh, you'll be able to look at all the prompts that I've used. So if you like, I just don't know what to do with this, then that might help. So you can tweet me at The Creative Pen, send me pictures of where you're listening, email me joanna at thecreativepen.com, leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by draft to digital and I will play a word from Kevin in a minute. So personally, I use draft to digital for distribution to Nook, libraries and subscription services, as well as for payment splitting for the relaxed author with Mark Leslie Lefebvre. It's brilliant if you're co-writing. This week, I even use them to distribute to Apple Books, which I normally do direct, but... <laughs> It's it's a short story and the amount of work was just not worth it. So, um, yes, the draft to digital interface is far superior. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons and the extra stuff I do. For example, the in between episodes on AI. I'm especially grateful to those patrons who continue to support the show for years and months. It demonstrates you find the show useful and want it to continue. So thanks to new patrons this week, Dee Smith, Anne Zavorskas, I hope that's right, Anne, (laughs) Simon, Sarah, Lindsay Sparks, SK Lasky, Judy M. Baker and Plotter. Thanks, Ryan, Plotter. And that is another great tool to check out. That's P-L-O-T-T-R. So if you support the show on Patreon, you'll get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only, which is around 45 minutes of audio um, and and some notes, which essentially I I answer patron questions. You can support the show with a few dollars or euros or pounds or whatever. And you can do that at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. I'm going to make a little tune out of that one of these days. <laughs> you can tell that I actually read this every show, right? <laughs> right, I'll play a word from Draft to Digital and then we'll get on with the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with Draft to Digital. Ebooks are amazing, but there's just something about having your book in print. The crack of the spine, the weight and feel, the smell. Ah, everybody loves a good paperback. And that's why we built D2D Print. It's the easiest way to get your book from pixel to print with just a couple of clicks. We take care of you with free layout templates and formatting, and we can convert your ebook cover into a full wraparound print cover automatically. And if you run into trouble, we're just an email away with all the author support you've come to know and love. Come check out D2D Print and all the cool tools we've built for you. Find more at d2d.tips slash creative pen. That's pen with two N's. Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer is a historical fiction author, speaker, course creator, and Choctaw storyteller. The Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian honored her as a literary artist for her work in preserving Choctaw Trail of Tears stories, and she is the creator of the fiction writing American Indian's Digital Course. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you, Joanna. Halito. Sahochafoyet, Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, Choctaw Sia Hoke. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, and I am Choctaw, and it's just such a delight to be on your podcast, Joanna. 
Oh, I love that. And of course, we have listeners from over 200 countries. So perhaps you can first explain what is Choctaw anyway, and how does that relate to your writing? And also advise on the preferred terminology, because we mentioned American Indian, which I thought was not allowed anymore. So tell us about that. Oh, I'm going to, I will try to give you the short answer on that one. But let me first tell you about Choctaws and my Choctaw people. So we are an American Indian tribe originally in the southeastern United States, uh, primarily Mississippi was our, our homelands. And that's where my ancestors came from before we uh, were forced to basically sign a treaty, the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, which ceded the last of the Choctaw homelands for lands in Indian Territory, or what is now the state of Oklahoma. And so we had the Trail of Tears in the 1830s, where about 20,000 Choctaws were removed and came across the trail over 400 miles to the new homelands. And it's estimated that around 2,000 died. And that's why it became known as a Trail of Tears and Death. Thankfully, our Choctaw people are very resilient, and we rebuilt the tribe and the nation to what is now the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and we're the third largest federally recognized tribe in the United States. There are also the, still the Mississippi Choctaws, the Mississippi Band of Choctaws who remained in Mississippi and were federally recognized in the 20th century. And we have some pockets of Choctaws really everywhere. I meet Choctaws everywhere that I go. There's a large contingent in California during the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, many of them migrated out from Oklahoma, but there were over 500 nations here in America prior to European contact. So the Choctaws were among that, but each tribe were distinct. And how that relates to my writing, I have seven Choctaw, what I call my Choctaw heritage books, where I feature our Choctaw history and culture. I do a lot of research and interviews, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But I have seven of those books that I've based around my Choctaw history and culture. The terminology, boy, that that's the the big question. And you're going to get different answers depending on who you speak with. So I did decide to title my course fiction writing American Indians. That's still one of the really a dominant term with among in Indian country, what we say, the National Museum of the American Indian, and there's just tons of organizations that still go with American Indian. Native American is considered the politically correct term. A lot of natives do reject that term. And then you'll meet those that completely reject the term American Indian and are offended whenever I use that sometimes. So the term Indian itself alone has been so abused and used derogatorily that you just have to be careful and really understand how and why you're using it. And so actually, my favorite terminology right now is First Americans. And we have Hmm. the First American Museum in Oklahoma City that opened up recently. And I, I love that they went with that name. But depending on who you're asking, you'll get a different answer. Now, the most correct way, like for me, I don't necessarily say typically that I'm American Indian or I'm Native American. I say I am Choctaw. And that's the most correct way to refer to someone is by their tribal affiliation, if you can. And and forgive me, I just don't know much about this. And I'm sure some people listening don't either. I mean, we have in our mind a sort of monolithic group of people. And I know of tribes, but I'd never heard of Choctaw before you yes. emailed me. And I was like, wow, okay. I think we hear about like Navajo, for example, is a sort of yes. one that I think probably because I've been to the, the Grand Canyon and mm. stuff like that. So I feel like for many people listening, this might be the first time, but it's the same in a lot of different countries. Right. There might be an indigenous people, but they will be made up of lots of different people. Like, for example, on my Mm. books and travel podcast has an Australian Aboriginal lady and they also have hundreds of different groups and lots of different languages. Mm. So I love that you shared your language there as well. So you've told us a bit more about your Choctaw side, but tell us a bit more about how you got into writing and a bit more about your your history. Oh, absolutely. I'm one of those that I always knew I wanted to be a writer. I know some people discover that later in life. I'm just one of those that whenever I was five, I wrote my first story and it was just little block sentences, uh, wrote them on sticky notes and my brother illustrated it. But I had a story about kindness and I was so shy. I knew I would not be able to 
ever say it, never be able to speak it. And so I wrote it down as a story and just continued writing through childhood and my teen years and got away from it a bit. And then whenever I was 23, over a decade ago, I can say, God brought writing back into my life and I joined uh, an association that we did flash fiction every week. And so I wrote over 60 of those all different genres, really just exploring my voice and my style as a writer. And in 2013, I got into indie publishing and haven't looked back. Oh, that's great. It's fantastic. Actually, I was going to say around the American Indian thing is that it's almost there's a sort of search engine optimization because that's still the term that people might search for in the same way, not in the same way, but similarly self-publishing. A lot of us use the term self-publishing, even though we don't do it ourselves. It's because it's people actually (laughs) search for and that's what they ask. Whereas you just said indie publishing and that's what we say within the group, Mm. but outside the group, people say self-publishing. So I imagine it's kind of the same. It's like when you're in the group, you have different language to outside the group. So all of this is so in words, it's words and understanding. It's so interesting. But we are talking talking about this sort of heritage idea today. And of course, there are lots of people of of different races and groups who don't write about their heritage or may write a sort of bigger American story or not about a specific group. So why is writing about your heritage so important to you? That's an excellent question. I love that one because that is whenever I began my writing career in earnest, that's what I was drawn to. I wanted to write Trail of Tears stories. The biggest example I can give you, though, is Choctaws. Like I said, our history and culture, it's so familiar to us, but there are people who around the world, like you, have never even heard of the Choctaw people. And for me, most of the stereotypes and the conceptions that people have about indigenous people and especially Native Americans, American Indians comes from media. It comes from entertainment. And that's how we influence culture. And so since people didn't know about my history and culture, very specifically the Choctaw Code Talkers of World War I. So they were, a lot of people have heard of the Navajo. You mentioned the Navajos and they're one of the largest tribes in the United States. And they had the Navajo Code Talkers and the Marines during World War II. But very few people know that Code Talking started in World War I and the Choctaws were among the first and really the only ones who developed an actual code during World War I there in France. And I would ask people that and no one had heard of them. And I was like, I have to write this as a story. I have to get it out there in the mainstream to educate people, to let them know about the Choctaw people and our heritage and let them just experience that through fiction. And that that's what I've set out to do with many of my stories. Mm. And I mean, I guess people can write as you have a specific story about the people in that way. But I guess other writers might include a character with that history, for example, in the same way, like I don't write LGBTQ queer fiction, but I have characters who you know, a woman who loves a woman, for example, or I have characters who are different to my own situation. And I don't make a big deal about that side of them. That's just them. And I don't want to focus on that in the story. It's just they're a person. (laughs) So they have that as part of them. So if people listening, if they want to incorporate their heritage, but not overstate it, what are your tips about that? I guess it's about representation. How can we put people from all different groups into books? So they're represented as different types of normal jobs and all of that. So it's not questioned that a Choctaw person is whatever they are. Exactly. And that's, oh, there's so much to unpack with that because we've had a lot of discussions about that. And my friend and I, who uh, Molly Reader, she's an excellent writer in her own right, and she does fantasy and science fiction. And so we had a discussion a webinar with those writers of that genre. And that's something we were talking about is not putting in native characters for the sake of diversity, like make them real characters. So that's something that I think we need diverse characters and diverse cast. I think that's awesome. Just make sure they're developed, like you said, as a character of living their lives and going about their work. And they happen to also be Choctaw. Like it doesn't have to be specifically centered around that heritage 
uh, example I have of that is my Doc Beck Westerns series. And Doc Beck is an Omaha Indian woman doctor. And she's loosely based, her background is based on the real Dr. Susan LaFleche, who was an Omaha Indian woman doctor in the 1890s, uh, 1890s. And so I took that character, but I put her in a completely different situation. It's more about her being a female doctor in the Old West in this more male-dominated world. And so she has these adventures. It's more like an old TV Western. So her heritage is definitely a part of her, and it ties strongly into the last four books of the series. But the primary thing is she's a doctor, and she's going about her work and relationships more as a woman in the Old West, rather than specifically bringing out the Omaha Indian aspect of it. So I mm-hmm. think writers, they definitely have that diverse cast. If you want to focus on the heritage of a specific cultural group, just make them real people. And that's the biggest, I think, stereotype that we see with a lot of natives, like you have the wise guide. And so you have this native character and they're always in this role of being the wise guide or in advising the character. And so I think just having them in normal character positions is really a way to avoid that stereotype because it doesn't have to be just about their heritage to have that diversity in your cast. Yeah, you mentioned sci-fi there. I mean, the captain of the ship can be a female Choctaw. <laughs> right. You know, I <laughs> think that's that what someday. makes it. Yeah, exactly. That's what makes it interesting. And also science fiction is a a message of hope, which is we're still alive in the future. And I guess part Mm -hmm. of your Mm -hmm. reason for writing your heritage is you want your nation to continue into the science fiction. You want there to be chocked (laughs) or space captains in the future. And so I think this is what it's about for me anyway, in terms of trying to put different people in different roles is that this is only one aspect Mm -hmm. of them, isn't it? So if people wanted to put a Choctaw character in their book, are there any specific cultural callbacks that they might have that mark them out that way? Are there any things you would read in a book and go, yeah, that is a Choctaw character without them saying, I am Choctaw? (laughs) I love that. I guess it's show show don't tell. (laughs) Exactly. No, I love that. That's a, actually a really good point that would be good to to mark here. Like I said, there was 500 nations and we're all distinct people. So people like right now may be thinking of Choctaws and teepees and buffaloes. And we didn't live in teepees. We lived in, we had what we call chokas, which were winter homes. We had summer homes, which were log and uh, log and chink um, structures. So we were agrarian. Primarily, there is buffalo back there in our history and all, but we weren't like the Plains tribes that followed the buffalo and went on the summer buffalo hunts. That wasn't primarily Choctaw. So we see that a lot. And I've had our history department tell me that people will send in books and stories to them basically wanting an endorsement, per se. And they're like, we would have to rewrite this whole book to make it Choctaw because they're so heavily influenced by the mainstream stereotypes of what people think Indigenous people or American Indians are. And so with Choctaws, for me, like if I saw someone in regalia in traditional dress, I would know whether they were Choctaw or not based on what they were wearing. We have the distinct diamond pattern that you'll see on our shirts and our dresses, and that's to represent the diamondback rattlesnake. We have distinct dances and songs. So if someone were to put that in there of they were Choctaw, I I wouldn't even mind if the character said they're Choctaw, but you definitely want to show versus tell. And that just goes to doing your research, going to events. I tell that to people a lot. And what you said about, you know, that we're still here. That's a big thing is people think of American Indians in the past and we're still here. So if you can go to a powwow, there's protocol and things to follow, but go to Choctaw events, go to native events and learn about the individual cultures rather than just the blanket indigenous people stereotypes that we tend to fall fall into. And I even fell into it whenever I was first writing. And thankfully, my mother, who's, I mean, she's on it. And she pointed out some things to me that were stereotypical. And I was like, oh, right. Duh. And <laughs> so that's not very good representation as a Choctaw. So, so yeah, if someone wants to write specifically about Choctaws, get to know the Choctaw people. Yeah. And so you mentioned there the diamond pattern and the rattlesnake. 
So for, again, I would, we're just going to use the science fiction captain yeah, right, of the spaceship, sure. because to me, then perhaps I could have some kind of diamond pattern on the uniform, or mm. I could, he or she could wear like, I don't know, some piece of jewelry with the mm-hmm. rattlesnake on, or something that was a callback, or the colours, you mentioned the traditional mm-hmm. dress, presumably there are certain dyes, certain colours that would have been used mm-hmm. in in the dress, w- w- would that be yeah. correct? And we also, we have a lot of beadwork artists today that they make these beautiful medallions. And that's what a lot of Choctaws wear with their regalia. We have beaded collars that go over the dresses. So there's tons of aspects like that that you could absolutely incorporate into the spaceship captain's <laughs> uniform. <laughs> uniform. And I, I have a science fiction story series tucked way back in the corner, Joanna. I don't know if mm. it'll ever emerge, but it's tucked way, way back there. But yeah, it's fun things like that a patch with the diamond design. So I could definitely see that them incorporating their culture into their work, what they're doing. Yeah. And I I think that's what is important too, is kind of using proper elements from a culture. And it's these little details that make it clear that we've done our research. So let's talk about research. How do you recommend authors research and how do you research your own books to ensure accuracy? Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's uh, accuracy is such a huge part of what I do, because there is so much inaccuracy out there around American Indians and around Choctaws. So I spend a great deal of time on research for the writers listening. If you hate research, that's basically where I started. (laughs) I didn't hate research. I liked going and talking to people and going to events and that type of thing. But when it gets to the nitty gritty of how did they develop a photograph in a dark room in 1890, that just drives me nuts. But (laughs) the bigger aspects of it, researching the culture, I love talking to elders. That's one of the things that, and I say talking to them, I listen. Usually you can ask just one or two questions and you'll get a whole whole ton of insight and just hearing their voices and hearing the way they phrase things and those things just tuck in the back of my mind and end up in dialogue and that sort of thing. For my research on the Choctaw Code Talkers of World War I, a a number warrior, my novel that came out in 2018, I actually got to travel to France, which was marvelous. It was my first international trip and I got to go to the battlefields where they fought. And what was really amazing about that trip is even though I was researching mostly general World War I history, I got to experience the way that the Choctaw Doughboys would have in a lot of instances. I even had someone who asked when we told them a little bit about the Code Talker story. They were like, oh, did they send spoke signals? <laughs> and it was like, no, no, it was, it was telephone, telephone. But even that, having the experience of stereotypes going before them, and that's what they experienced when they went to France in 1918, is they had all these stereotypes that they were meeting with the French and the German and the British, who they had their perceptions of what American Indians and what Choctaws were. So research is I've done with that one, I had over 100 people in the acknowledgements. I went to the National Archives, the military records, and I worked with tons of historians and military experts. The main thing for writers who are looking into that is try to connect with the tribes. So some have cultural departments or historic preservation departments or language departments. A caveat to that is it can be difficult to get in because so much has been taken from. Native Americans, so much has been taken and stolen from our communities that you'll find some Native people, probably many who are guarded and who want to know what you're using this for and are hesitant about giving information because so much has been taken and abused and misused. So that does take time. And I cover that in my course of some ways that you can do that. But that's really the best thing is go to the source, go to the tribe as best you can and whatever they've preserved You try to base your work on that. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of recordings, oral history recordings as well, Mm because I mean, now everyone lives a very modern life, but there are often oral histories you can find. Certainly here in the UK, there's probably (laughs) recordings of Native Americans as well (laughs) that you can get just from the British Library. I'm sure that your Library of Congress or whatever has Mm-hmm. recordings and things. I'm glad you got to go in person. I think going, I've been to those World War One battlefields, <laughs> it's mm. super, super depressing, but um, oh, good to, hard. yeah, good to research. But let's just talk about some of these stereotypes. So when you mentioned the wise guide, I was thinking of, do you know the movie Legends of the Fall? 
No, I'm not familiar with that. No. Oh, well, it's exactly, yeah. it's a classic yeah. kind of okay. family yeah. living out on a ranch. And they have Indian people, I say Indian, Native American people who yeah. <laughs> live on the, and work on the farm. And the eldest man is is exactly that, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> he does the smoke <laughs> and everything. It's an older film now. It's probably the mid eighties or early nineties. And his character is very evocative and like he's a good character and you love this character so you have a very positive view of him but much media of Native Americans is the kind of whooping horseback tomahawk killing Mm. all the white people type of stereotype (laughs) which is what you see in a lot of westerns with the Mm. the older westerns I guess so do, do you have any movies or TV shows or media that people could watch where you feel that Native Americans of any tribe, I guess, are represented in a way that is more correct or more respectful? Mm-hmm. No, that's excellent. So the, um, as you said, the Westerns, and I grew up on Westerns and my papa, who I get my Choctaw heritage through, he was a huge Western fanatic. He he loved all of it. My dad did. And so that's what I grew up on. And that's why I created the Doc Beck Western series is I wanted to explore the Western genre, but I wanted to have that non-stereotypical, respectful representation of an American Indian in the lead role. I really wanted that as well. And so it, it really worked out to do the Doc Beck with this female Omaha Indian woman doctor. There are some, I think there's more negative representations than well done representations in movies and TV shows. I'm not real hip on a lot of the contemporary movies and stuff that are coming out, even in the historical genre. I know in a in a recent, it's a really popular TV show right now. There was even some controversy because they have a Lakota actor who is portraying one of the characters. And he did a sacred ceremony with one of the white characters on the TV show. And the Lakota Council, their cultural council, was actually upset about that. And people can go find the article on that. So even whenever you have actors who are are representing and bringing that aspect of it, you still have to look at it as a whole. And you're going to have conflict of, of what can be shared and what can't be shared on that. I would recommend right now, I love what the Chickasaw Nation is doing, and this is something that is is not mainstream, and you have to dig for it, but I think your listeners would really enjoy looking at some of their films. They have a production company now, and I love what they're doing. Their newest one is Montford, Chickasaw Rancher, and so he's a Chickasaw Rancher, and I love how they portray his character. It's based on a real person from the 1800s, and so I would recommend, you know, check out some films that have been done by uh, by native people and i know the chickasaws and i think the cherokees and some others have done it and done it well as as well and the chickasaw nation has a publishing company too the chickasaw press and i'm contracted with a book with them right now so i love when the tribes are putting it out there and not saying that it's going to be perfect or there won't be controversy around it but you are really getting that native perspective and there's something different about that and that's not to say non-natives can't write really well done, non-stereotypical stories like that. But if you can find some that are done by tribes, that's that's really awesome. Yeah. And personally, I feel that's also research is if you mm-hmm. want to include, like if I, as a British white woman, want to include my Choctaw <laughs> science fiction space captain, mm-hmm. uh, then for me to read books by Native American people Mm -hmm. will give me ideas that are better (laughs) than (laughs) potentially reading a Western by a British white man. (laughs) So, and the thing is, as we're talking about this, this discussion is difficult, right? And we mentioned this before we came on the call, is that there is at the moment a cancel culture or the way that people feel like, oh, I don't want to do that in case I get attacked, or in case I get taken down, or in case someone takes offense at me, I might try the best I possibly can. And then someone will find an issue and say I'm racist, or mm-hmm. they'll say they'll take something out of context. I've had this happen to me. Um, my mm-hmm. husband is Jewish, and I write about Jews and Israel. I am not Jewish. And I had someone accuse me of being a Nazi because they took a quote from one of my books completely out of context, put it on Twitter, and accused me of being like an ultra right wing Nazi, anti Semitic, blah, blah, oh. blah. Word. And I'm like, seriously, if you had actually read the rest of the book, you would understand that that is about as far away from me as I can get. Now, that's just a personal uh, example. Yeah. Um, yet I I deliberately include people of lots of different cultures 
in my books because I think it's so important. So what are your thoughts on writing diverse characters outside of our personal experience? That is the hot topic today. And there is so much controversy around it. And it was so much that I I had wanted to create the course that I did for many years, but it that was one of the hesitancies because it is so controversial. And there are n- many Native authors who don't want non-Natives writing our history and culture. And we have the own voices movement and those types of things. And I think that's wonderful. I mean, Natives, we need to write our history and culture I also wouldn't block, you know, from the other side as a writer, I understand that we explore all different cultures and histories and experiences that are not our own. I write from the male perspective. I write, I have Jewish characters. I have black characters. I have Indian characters all in my Choctaw Tribune series. I have diverse characters. I have diverse friends. I live, you know, in that myself. And then as writers, if we can't write about these things, if we can only write about what we know and experience that would be a very very narrow boring. Uh, writing war yeah that's very yeah my world would be very boring it's like who wants mine to would too me you know i can only write about women who are part choctaw part white it's like that's that's all yeah, I can living in suburbia in being a writer i mean come on that, that's that would be very strange and so i i hate that you had that experience and that is really i've known of writers almost being in tears because they want to write native american characters but they're afraid they'll get it wrong they'll afraid they'll be criticized and honestly they probably will face that no matter what you do just as you said your research your husband's jew you've done all of these things and your story's not even that and you're still going to receive you still receive criticism. And so you're going to have that. But ultimately, for me, I believe that writers should be be, uh, judged based on the quality of their writing and not on their race. So regardless of what their ethnicity is, regardless of what their background or religious beliefs, we should be able to explore all of those in writing, but do it in a respectful, well-researched way. And that's just my message for writers who want to write about Native Americans. I'm as as a Choctaw, I'm open to that. And I want to teach writers how to do that in the best way they can, because I think most writers have a heart for doing it right. I don't think writers are setting out to be offensive or to be rude or to be hateful or racist. They're setting out to write a good story. And I, I want to help writers do that. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of people, this there is more of an awareness of this now. And when authors do it in a deliberate fashion, they are doing it in all, because they're trying to do it respectfully, unless they are not, obviously. There are some people who write <laughs> things who are not being respectful, but we're not talking to them. So you've mentioned the wise guide. We've mentioned the tomahawk wielding <laughs> Indian <laughs> on a horse. Are there any other stereotypes that you get really annoyed about and want to question? I think the, um, yeah, oh, there's so many and people can, I actually have an ebook, a free ebook of five stereotypes writers can avoid when they're writing about Native Americans. And so I have five of them in there. I have 12 in my course and I have people who have done a ton of research on American Indians. They're like, I didn't even know some of these things. And a lot of people, a lot of them people will be familiar with, and there's nothing wrong with having the wise guide. I, I could point that out. If that's a character in someone's story, just make sure it's not stereotypical and they're put in there specifically for that reason. And that's the only aspect of the American Indian character that we get to see. So the other stereotype that I could point out that is, is not really well um Talk, not talked about very often. And that's what I call the historical only point of view. And that's where people write about, especially if they're writing historical fiction or even fantasy, where they have this perception or this viewpoint that American Indians are in the past, that it's all about history and what went on in the past rather than. And so when they write from that perspective, there's almost this ending to the character, like their way of life and their people are going to end in the 19th century. And what my perspective is whenever I'm writing historical fiction is the people go on, my people go on and our culture and our history lives on well into the future to my lifetime. And I think continuing on further into the future. So when writers have that historical only point of view, there's just this almost closure of we're writing about this people group that no longer exist and just having that awareness that that native people are still here. Yeah, that's so important. And I mean, you mentioned so you, on your father's side, so you, do you identify as mixed race? 
I am. And when I say uh, my, so my papa on my mother's side is my, through my mother's where I get my Choctaw ancestry. And my dad was a, a Kansas farm boy, you know, <laughs> he was, and, and my mother, we, we have Irish ancestry and French. I mean, we have it all mixed back in there. So we are uh, one of the terms that was used back in the 19th century and 20th century, even and today is mixed bloods. And that's what we are. We're mixed race. And so I, I write about my Choctaw heritage and some people Typically, I think you you were saying what's one of the questions I get asked often. One of them is when I tell people I'm Choctaw, they're like, well, how much? (laughs) (laughs) Is that an offensive question? That it's not offensive to me. Some people will take offense to it because no other race is based on blood quantum other than Indians and dogs is what (laughs) one professor (laughs) says. Uh, We're the only ones that get the dipstick. But what, what I like to let people know is my fourth generation grandfather buried his father on the trail of tears and I'm 100% his descendant. And that that's how much Choctaw I am. That is, but that's a really interesting question. Like, That's just not something someone would ask me, even though I have done one of those genetic tests. And Uh I'm like a ridiculous number of different racial backgrounds. I mean, I have something like 12 different racial characteristics. So it is really interesting. That question is, there's so much in there. Yes, there is. (laughs) Isn't there? And again, I'm just asking these questions because I want people to feel like it's okay. Do you look... Native American because we're on audio only and I feel like that might be something else when people ask that question is that because they look at you and think well you just look like I don't know the Kansas farm girl right (laughs) I do I do look more like the Kansas farm girl I have the hazel eyes and white skin you put me next to my brother who were full brother and sister same mom and dad and we look completely different he's actually he looks so Choctaw he's on the cover of two of my books (laughs) (laughs) that's brilliant has the dark skin he's been to Nicaragua and Mexico uh, Jamaica and wherever he's at people just start speaking to them and their to him in their language because they think he's just part of whatever they are and and he's like I'm an America right <laughs> sometimes when he lands so so he he has the dark skin and my mother has the darker skin and so people were always asking her when she was growing up you know what are you like they didn't even know it's like <laughs> you're not Hispanic you're not white what are you and so I don't get offended with that but and it's really not because of my skin color that people ask me that because they ask my mother that they'll ask my brother that they ask my nephew that uh, which which tickled me because he has the hazel eyes blonde hair and dark skin so people are always asking him what are you and he's like I'm human (laughs) yeah I'm human that 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 is very good but it's so interesting I I feel like people always want to put people in boxes and Mm -hmm. as writers we are guilty of this because we Mm -hmm. put characters in boxes and we say this needs to be this because of story reason um (laughs) and so I guess our overarching message is just don't assume anything just make someone Mm -hmm. a well-rounded character in your Mm -hmm. writing and that yeah they might be part Choctaw and maybe I imagine some of the people who are in your situation whatever that percentage is don't identify in that way like plenty of people don't identify with their heritage so yeah don't assume things about your characters but create them in a respectful way and do your research I guess that, that's probably mm-hmm. the message that, that that really is that really is because and that's what we need to do with all of our characters right we don't want them to be one-dimensional and they're just there to serve a specific role in the story you want them to be a fully fleshed out character mm, for sure right so just tell us a bit more about your course and where people can find you online Oh, wonderful. So my course is called Fiction Writing American Indians, and you can find it at AmericanIndians.FictionCourses.com. And if you scroll to the bottom of that page is where you can download the free PDF, uh, Five Stereotypes to Avoid When Writing About Native Americans. For my books, visit ChoctawSpirit.com. And you'll also, that's my shared site with my mother who does beadwork, Choctaw beadwork. But you'll find all of my books on there. And you can find them, of course, on all of the major online platforms. And for my course, Joanna, if it's all right, I created a coupon code called the Creative Pen for $30 off for anyone who uses that coupon code and enrolls in the course. Brilliant. And is that pen with a double N? It is. (laughs) <laughs> brilliant absolutely well, thanks. <laughs> brilliant well thanks so much for your time Sarah that was great oh I appreciate it Joanna and we don't have a word for goodbye in Choctaw we say I will see you again soon 
So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Sarah and that it gave you some ideas about how to incorporate diverse characters, research in more detail, and even educated you a little about the Choctaw people. I certainly learned a lot and I really enjoyed the conversation. So next week, I'm talking to Honoré Corder about book marketing mindset, lots of ideas and ambition. Now, Honoré is fantastic and she gave me some great ideas in this interview, so I know you will find it useful. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>